previously on From. <laughs> I'm just playing. Yo, welcome Fromily back to our reaction for the show From. I'm your host, Anthony, and this is where I give you the latest and greatest in news and reviews. Today, we're breaking down the third episode of From Season 2 titled The Kindness of Strangers, which is also the title of a book by Katrina Kittle. Now, it's interesting how they intertwine real world books and songs into this show that inform themes of the story, sort of like a vision board. But first, do me a favor. If you're new here, please consider giving this channel a like and subscribe to keep up with our weekly from analyses and breakdown and enable notifications so you're able to watch these videos right after the episode airs. Anyway, back to from. We're opening up with Boyd in a bathroom, checking out his arm in the mirror and trying to calm down from whatever the hell just happened to him. We quickly switch to Boyd talking to his son, Ellis, who's a little stressed out and wondering where the hell is Sarah? Boyd doesn't have any answers aside from telling his son he went through a hole in a tree and ended up somewhere else, which sounds as absurd to Ellis as it does to me when I say it out loud. Ellis blows up on his dad and Boyd tries to calm him down. He eventually gets Ellis to talk a bit more and reveals that he and Fatima are having issues. Ellis proposed to Fatima toward the end of last season and things have been stressful for each of them as they realize that they have to try to make a life in this place. Boyd gives Ellis a pep talk and advises him to try a little harder with giving Fatima an engagement ring besides that little wired doodad around her fingers. <laughs> now, in season one, Boyd and Ellis had a tense relationship for most of the season. Ellis was carrying a lot of emotional baggage after the death of his mother at his father's hands. Now, things were extremely complicated with his mom, Abby, seeming to have a mental breakdown and going on a killing spree on the residents of the town. Boyd had no choice but to stop Abby after she seemed to point her weapon at their son. Knowing this helps us understand why Ellis is able to get so aggressive and agitated with his dad so quickly. You know, he's still clearly processing that trauma and is carrying a lot of emotional baggage. We then switch to Jim Matthews in the town's hospital being tended to by Christy after getting trapped under the rubble of his collapsed house. Christy is putting stitches in his forehead while his wife Tabitha is watching. Now, it's good to see Tabitha and Jim reunited, especially after Jim tried to heroically save Tabitha in the season one finale. You know, we remember we hear that voice in that finale on the radio warning Jim that Tabitha shouldn't be digging that hole. Something worth noticing throughout is that their kids are actually in the same room. I guess they finally learn their lesson and we see Jim, Tabitha, Julie, and Ethan all sticking together while Jim is getting stitched up. And I'm going to have to take back what I said last episode about them being this show's version of the Starks from Game of Thrones. Plus, Jim actually survived season one, so there's that too. Jim finds out he has three cracked ribs and a concussion after being trapped under the house, but it doesn't take long for Jim to ask the kids to leave the room. <sighs> Jim takes a few moments to catch up with his wife, Tabitha, and she lets him in on the fact that the wires, the, you know, the electrical wires that she was digging the hole to investigate, they actually don't lead anywhere. And there's no source of power underneath the houses for electricity. Now, you might remember in the first season that the question was asked how the electricity works in the town if the outlets don't actually provide electricity. And that's what made Tabitha start digging that hole under the house to try and find the source of the electricity. I don't know how the lights work, but they just work. And the thought was that if Tabitha started digging that hole, she would find some answers. The lie detector determined that, that was, was a lie. lie. Jim lets her know that they need to talk. But then we switch scenes to Randall, AKA Captain America, AKA not Chris Evans. And Donna and he are having a friendly conversation outside the bus. Randall is arguing with Donna about his gun. And we didn't know he had a gun. And He's been keeping it with him and now that the bus people are realizing that they're not going anywhere they have to have a conversation about this weapon the argument isn't going donna's way until boyd intervenes and lets him know that residents don't carry guns and that's the rule and obviously it's a good rule if you remember abby and boyd used to walk around with guns and mm, randall is ready to let him know the rules change but boyd then lets him and us know that he's not with the shits you want to keep your gun randall fine Take your gun, 
go live in a cabin in the woods and f around and find out. But if you want to stay in this town, you put the rifle down and follow the rules. Randall makes a wise choice and puts that rifle down. The bus people then start making their way to Colony House. We then switch to Tabitha, Ethan, and Julie who are in the diner getting ready to eat some breakfast. You know, I still don't know how they're getting all this food. Like, there's a fruit bowl and everything on this table. I know that the chickens and the other animals wander into town, but how are we getting fruit? If this ain't a snow globe experiment, then I don't know what it is. Anyway, Ethan asks if they can go see Victor, but Tabitha says that they need to chill because it's been a rough few days for her and Victor. Ethan lets her know that he and Jade went through Victor's room to look for clues. Tabitha then sees Kenny's mom and asks if they can go through the supply closet to rummage for clothes and stuff since all of their supplies and clothing were lost when their house collapsed. Kenny's mom then invites Tabitha and her family to stay at her house. Now outside, Donna and are still chatting after calming down after Captain America, I mean not Chris Evans, I mean Randall and Boyd had their blow up and they're wondering if there are enough supplies to provide with all these new people. Is there enough stuff to go around? Donna tells them straight up that they lost half their crops in the storm that showed up at the end of last season. She also lets Boyd know that they only found 22 of the 25 people that were on the bus. She also asks Boyd what happened out in the woods, but before we get answers, we switch to Kenny and Ellis in the woods, setting traps for, I don't know, wildlife, animals, and picking flowers. Well, Ellis is picking flowers because he wants to give them to Fatima, and Kenny wants to set traps, but he can't find the rod that helps prop up the trap. That's hmm. when we randomly hear music playing and it's weird because they're in the woods so they go off to investigate. We then see a young girl in the woods with that missing rod stuck through her forehead and pinned to a tree. This scene right here, oh my god. This has to be one of the most gnarly things this show has shown us yet and we've seen a lot. I mean, this girl looks downright peaceful with a freaking piece of metal going through her brain. Ugh. The music was coming from her cell phone which had an alarm set. Kenny asks Ellis to help him free her from the tree so that they can bury her in the town. When she scares the fuck out of all of us and wakes up like from yo what are you doing to me? Yo my heart yo like yo I almost spit out my water, peed on myself and choked on my spit all at once like WTF yo what? on yo kenny then runs off to get christy as the girl in the tree begs ellis to help her we then switch to victor walking back into his room in colony house to see that a tornado had been through his room and it was a mess victor then starts looking around his stuff and realizes that someone had been in his room and took something now you might remember that lady who got the glass in her eye back in episode one she walks in to see Victor is alive and lets him know that Ethan and Jade were in here while he was away. Victor starts beelining out the door to get to the bottom of this stuff and I love this scene. Victor seems a little menacing in his appearance but he's definitely childlike in his behavior and when he marches out the door in anger, he makes sure to say, excuse me, to the lady as he walks by. You know, and I love these little details. Victor is one of the most interesting characters in the show, especially when you realize he's basically a man-child suffering from a lot of trauma. We then switch to a shot of Jade playing the violin while at Kenny's house, and we see Victor walking into the house from outside, but he slows down when he hears the music playing. You know, I'm not surprised that Jade knows how to play violin because of course he knows how to play violin. Victor then knocks at the door and demands that Jade give him back his violin in a progressively, increasingly angry manner. He then tells Jade, you don't go in my room. But you'll hmm. notice that when Victor is angry that he doesn't give Jade eye contact. Kind of like the kid who knows not to look in the eyes of an adult or he'll get in trouble. Jade then tries to reason with Victor and asks him questions about the symbol that he'd been seeing along with the book full of symbols that the guy in the photo must have created. Jade asks him about the photo because he recognizes that's a photo of Victor as a child. Jade pleads with Victor to tell him about the photo and the guy so that they can go home. Victor pauses and tells him to stay away from him. We then switch to Christy and her fiance Marielle. Their reunion this time isn't as nice as it was the first time with Marielle giving Christy the cold shoulder. She's still in shock from, you know, 
everything. And as they're talking, Kenny comes busting in the door looking for Chrissy to help with the girl with the metal rod in her brain. They rush off and then we switch to the girl sitting in the woods with Ellis. She lets Ellis know that the rod doesn't hurt and tells Ellis her name is Kelly. She asks Ellis, where are they? And Ellis tells her that, you know, they're in the woods. That's when she starts to remember what happened because the last time we saw her, Kelly was in the bar slash gas station with some guy, Brian, that was on the bus with her. And last we saw is they opened the door for the people monster. Now, we all know that she f***ed up, right? She tells Ellis that the creatures tortured her friend Brian and made her watch because they wanted to play with her. Christy and Kenny then show up. Christy takes a look at Kelly's injuries and doesn't say a word. What's interesting to me is that Christy is also remarkably calm. Like, she didn't even flinch at the sight of this metal rod going through this woman's head. We then switch to Jim in the hospital and he notices something it's such a small thing that most people wouldn't even think twice about but jim notices that the exit sign above the door does a little flicker when you think about it the fact that the light flickered even a little is very odd and kind of reminds me of when the lights were flickering in colony house during the storm jim gets up out of his bed to take a look when the old lady from the bus walks in looking for christy you remember her right that's the one that was dancing in the rain. She tells Jim that the boy that got stuck in the house with Jim sat across the aisle from her. She's talking about Brick. She and Jim chat a bit longer about the bus that she was on. Before Jim could get out his last question, he falls over in pain. Christy's fiance, Marielle, walks in and helps Jim back to his chair to get situated. Jim then learns that Christy and Marielle are engaged. And he learns that from the lady who was speaking with him. And then we switch to Elgin and Fatima outside Colony House. Now, Fatima is showing Elgin around and letting him know that she's going to be his proxy slash guide to getting acclimated to their situation. They chat for a bit with Fatima sharing that she's been there for a year with Elgin randomly asking Fatima if there's water nearby, like a lake or a pond. Fatima tells him that there is a pond nearby named the Brundles. She takes him to the Brundles and they chat some more about how Elgin saw the lake in a dream. Fatima also mentions that others have had dreams in the past about this place and it happens to some but not everyone. They've studied and tried to figure out the nature of their situation but nobody has figured a way out. We then switch back to Christy, Ellis, Kenny and Kelly with the rod in her brain. They talk a bit about the situation and how it would take a 15 hour surgery to remove the rod from her head. They then come to the conclusion that there's only one choice. Kenny offers to use his firearm, but Christy is against the idea of Kelly's last moments being that with a gun to her head and tells him that they need to pull out the rod. Now hold on for a second because I don't know about you, but just thinking about this for a second. I feel like it would actually be a lot more cruel to put someone through the act of forcefully yanking a metal rod out of their brain than using something like a firearm. Like, wouldn't that be quicker? Seriously, I don't agree with Christy's idea here and I think she's downright wrong. Kelly then calls Christy and they have the chat. Kelly asks Christy if she's going to die and Christy patiently and lovingly says yes. And I appreciate the honesty here and the delivery because at least that seems gracious. We switch back to Tabitha and Julie going through Mrs. Lou's supplies and they're going through the things in order to find some clothes. They find a few items and they start heading outside when Julie asks if they're going to be staying with Kenny and his mom and Jay. Now, I have to pause for a second because I'm starting to feel like Julie might have a little bit of a crush on Jay. She had a moment when she stood up to Jade back in season one because he had that weird nickname for her dad. And I think it's carried over into season two with her keeping her crush on the down low. Julie is at that age and I'm guessing there's slim pickings in town and all that. But <laughs> anyway, as they're walking out of this barn that I don't think I've ever seen before, Tabitha sees two creepy ass kids standing in the middle of the road staring at her like, In the daytime? One of these kids actually reminds me of the little girl that Tabitha saw in the caves under the town with Victor. Tabitha blinks, they're gone, 
and they get the hell out of there quickly. We then switch back to Boyd. Now, this scene is a little different because we're seeing Boyd visiting his wife's grave in a field. Now, I find it interesting that he buried his wife away from town and away from the cemetery. Like, he's keeping her separate and isolated for himself. Anyway, he's visiting Abby's grave and he's kind of talking to her about everything that's been going on, including Ellis's engagement and how he's starting to question whether any of what's happening is real. He starts suggesting that there's a possibility that he's lying in a hospital bed with Ellis by his side. He's questioning his reality based on his experience in that cave and meeting Martin. You might remember that before he left the cave, Martin asked him, what if Abby was right? What if this is all a dream? So it kind of makes sense that Boyd finds himself at Abby's grave, questioning the likelihood that this may not even be real. Now, I take all of this very seriously, especially because this show is from the executive producers of Lost, and anyone who remembers that show knows, well, I'll just leave it at that. If you haven't seen Lost, I highly recommend watching the first two, maybe three seasons of that show, which also deals with a group of people in a fantastical place, just like From does, but it kind of goes off the rails after the second or third season, so I can't really... First three seasons, that's what I'm recommending. Anyway, back to From. The show then switches back to Tabitha and Julie unpacking the clothes that they found at Mrs. Lou's storage, and Julie starts pressing her mom to talk to her about what it is that she saw outside the barn that freaked her out. Tabitha doesn't want to say anything, and I have to tell you that I don't understand why people are keeping things to themselves, especially Tabitha. She eventually shares that she saw something and that this isn't the first time that she saw something either. She starts talking about her son, Thomas. You remember Thomas. Thomas is the one that passed before the show started, and Thomas was the motivation for their divorce. She mentions how she thought she could hear Thomas crying in his crib after he died, but this wasn't quite like that. She tells Julie that she saw those freaky-looking kids staring at her in the road, and this is big. Tabitha has been through a lot of trauma even before this show started and seems pretty reluctant to talk about much of anything. That's all been changing as Jim has been doing more and more for his family while in this town. We finally switch back to Christy, Ellis, Kenny, and Kelly in the woods. This whole scene is pretty messed up. Kelly starts talking to everyone and asking everyone their names. She asks for her phone to call her mom, and the saddest thing happens when Christy promises to write a note that they'll send to Kelly's mom. She says that she has a pen and paper, but that's a lie. That was a lie. <laughs> Kelly tells her to tell her mom that she loves her and sorry that she didn't give her a hug. After a few moments, Kelly starts screaming in pain, and I have no idea why it took so long for the pain to hit. The screams attract Boyd, who comes out of nowhere. Boyd tells him to bounce and that he's going to handle it from here. But Christy won't leave. We then see the most horrific thing I've seen on television with Boyd pulling out the rod from her head. After a few moments, the screaming stops. Christy then rushes back to her fiance, Marielle, and begs her to stay and not return to the group on the bus. And I'm like, what the f they did what Christy insisted that they do. Kenny and Boyd both offered a way to give this woman mercy without making her suffer like that, but Christy wouldn't let them do it. We switched to Ellis and Kenny consoling each other about what they just witnessed, but they're both pretty shaken by the whole thing. We switched to Ellis walking into the diner to find Fatima sitting alone drinking tea. Ellis tells Fatima that he doesn't want to wait until they get home to get married and kind of asks Fatima if they can get married sooner than later, and she agrees. We then switch to Ethan sitting on the porch of Mrs. Lou's house playing with some building blocks when Tabitha walks out and wants to talk to him. Now, the thing that immediately catches my eye is that this puzzle is the same exact puzzle that Tabitha saw in the cave when she got freaked out. It's weird to me that she didn't immediately recognize it, but when she does, we immediately see those two weird-looking kids staring at her from the road again. 
She grabs Ethan and heads inside the house without saying what she saw. We then switch to Donna in the greenhouse outside Colony House when Boyd walks in and tells Donna about what happened to Kelly. Boyd is shaken up about the whole thing, and without Father Cotry being around anymore, he now confides in Donna, which is an interesting pivot. They used to not like each other or get along very well, but after their experiences, they now kind of work with and rely on each other. Boyd then starts telling Donna about his time in the service as a Marine, and he served with someone nicknamed Smuckers. This soldier died in Boyd's arms, and it was the first time Boyd watched someone die. He told Donna that the name of the soldier was Corporal Brian Kelly. Brian and Kelly are the names of the people that were tortured by the people monsters in the woods. Donna actually isn't in any condition to help console Boyd, and she tells him that she's starting to be worn down too. She couldn't handle it when the people on the bus wouldn't listen, and she pop their tire with her shotgun and she needs Boyd to have his shit together because she can't do it. Boyd listens and says he's okay, letting her know that he's going to step up. We then switch to Kenny, who's in the church that Father Cotri used to live in. He's looking around Father Cotri's stuff and opening drawers as if he's searching for something. As he's headed into the basement, he hears a noise. And he makes his way downstairs only to discover that Sarah is back. Yup, we haven't seen Sarah since the season one finale. And the last time we saw her, she was in the forest telling Boyd to get in the faraway tree that put him in that well. She says, hi, Kenny. And the episode ends. Now, this episode does introduce a lot of interesting plot points with the creature monsters playing with Brian and Kelly in the woods. Now, Brian and Kelly not being killed and also us not finding Brian's body is a little different. It's not the normal way that we've seen these creatures react to people. In addition, Boyd, with his theory that maybe he's not awake, maybe he's potentially in a coma, with their names being reflections of the soldier that he served with, is... Another interesting theory or mystery that's introduced in this episode. Since when do these creatures play with their food and why is it that the names of the people that showed up coinciding with someone he knew? The people who showed up on this bus definitely seem to have ties to the people who are already there one way or another. Marielle showing up is the biggest and strongest one. However, there are others like we're learning with Boyd. I still have my theory that these people have been kidnapped and are in some sort of contained environment, and this episode is adding clues to that. Something that is more interesting is that the recurrence of the theme of soldiers and war. Now, this is a sub-theme that kind of gets introduced in season one. Jade kind of had that vision where he was being chased by a soldier. In addition to that, Martin being a veteran of the Marines, Boyd and his wife Abby being Marines, and then the name of Smuckers, a.k.a. Brian Kelly. There seems to be another underlying theme and string of clues that might be helpful to figuring out exactly what's going on. I don't know how all these puzzle pieces fit together just yet, but I'm starting to get a much clearer idea that's firming up my theories on what's happening. Anyway, formally, that's all I have for this one. Do me a favor. If you're new here to this channel, hit that like button. Please hit that like button. It does a lot to help me in 2023. YouTube still relies on the like and the watch time to help channels grow. And I need to grow so I can keep doing this week in and week out so that we can figure this out together. Otherwise, I'm going to have to check you guys later. Peace.